takes pleasure in attracting a stellar list of speakers that address today's most relevant issues. The club's place as a refuge for rich discussion and networking has never wavered after 123 seasons. We are dedicated to encouraging debate on the issues that matter to this city, this province, and this country. The Canadian Club is one of the most important podiums anywhere in the world that a Canadian can speak to, tell Canadians what it is that they think, develop those thoughts. And so I want to thank you for that very, very much. Please join me in thanking our esteemed panelists today. Through our programs and events, including our youth and young leaders programs, our diversity partnerships, our joint events, and our media and social media opportunities, we offer you access to dynamic, political, social, and business figures from abroad and right here at home. The platform from which the eloquence of Canada has flowed all of that time, whether it be business, education, politics, sports, arts and culture. If someone wants to say something to Canadians about this country and about the future of this country, this is the venue you choose. Anine, hello, bonjour, and thank you for joining us. My name is Karen Restool, and I'm a director with Canadian Club Toronto. Although we're meeting virtually today, we recognize that Canadian Club Toronto sits in the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. We thank them, their ancestors, all those who have come before us for caring for the land and water in a way that allows us to continue to gather here today. Miigwech, Miawen. Merci à tous de vous être joints à nous pour la discussion aujourd'hui. Thank you to each of you for tuning in for today's discussion. Today, we're joined by a panel of experts to discuss challenges and opportunities with electric vehicles in Canada. Companies are innovating and infrastructure is being built. But are we seizing the opportunities to lead the world in vehicle and battery production? Will cities and regions embrace electrified transit? What does the future of EV look like in Canada? Now, before we hear from our panelists, here's some information on how you can participate with us. The click here to switch stream button helps if you find that your internet is slow. The video quality may decrease, but the audio quality should remain strong. Once you click the questions tab, you can enter your questions in the window and they will be sent to the moderator. The request help button located in the bottom right hand of the page is for technical support. The Canadian Club is a nonprofit and we have been gathering people for over 124 years. And it is because of our sponsors that we can continue to do that. We thank today's event sponsors, Borden Ladner Gervais and Panasonic. We're grateful for your support for today's discussion. All right, let's get to it. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing our panelists. We have Brian Kingston, President and CEO of Canadian Vehicle Manufacturers Association. Welcome, Brian. We have Josipa Petrunic, is President and CEO of the Canadian Urban Transit Research and Innovation Consortium. Welcome. We have Paul Subri, President and CEO for NFI Group. Welcome. And Charles Todd, Senior Director of Investments with Canada Infrastructure Bank. Welcome. And today's discussion will be moderated by Leslie Wu, CEO of Civic Action. Welcome and thank you for lending your time and your views today. Guests, panelists, at this time, I ask you to reach over for your cups. One of the club's traditions that has not changed in this virtual world is the toast we make to our country. Now, with your drink in hand, please join me in a toast to Canada. And with that, Leslie, I'll turn the Canadian Club podium over to you. Terrific. Thank you, Karen. And welcome, everyone. And welcome, Charles, Paul, Yusufa, 
and Brian. Um, I'm Leslie Wu, as uh, Karen introduced me, the CEO of Civic Action, and really excited to um, be part of this discussion. It is a very timely discussion. Um, at Civic Action, we've been very focused on the importance of inclusive cities, and at this point in time, on the heels of 2020, many of us are talking about how cities are going to build back better, how we're going to transform, and I think the discussion about electric vehicles is very much a part of that. I think we're going to have an opportunity to explore how EVs are going to be part of how we transform our environment, how we transform our economy and the nature of jobs that it provides an opportunity for, and, and ultimately, because this is what technology is for, how it changes the lives of residents all across this city region, this country. So without further ado, I'm going to um, ask Yasifa to kick us off and give us a little, uh, a bit of a context of the landscape. So the electric vehicle is part of a collection of industries uh, that is moving us to a decarbonized state. As we all know, um, the UN development goals are seeking uh, the importance of sustainable cities. Can you share with us uh, in the work that QTRIC is doing uh, across the country and with other nations, uh, what part the EV industry has in this effort? Thanks so much, Leslie. Uh, thanks to the Canadian club folks. Yeah, I have to say just preliminarily, I've gone to a lot of Canadian club events, made a lot of friends, and I feel like I've made it in life now that I'm one of the panels. So I'm gonna have to call my mom and brag about this after. So thanks so much for having me here. Now I'm really happy to answer your question. There's a short answer and a long answer. So the short answer is essentially in the electrified world, if we're talking about this as a surrogate for decarbonizing transportation, heavy duty electric vehicle sector, that sector which composes buses and trucks and coaches, it's going to transform Canadian lives because it's going to transform public transit in the fight to decarbonize transportation overall. And the end state here is one where we actually have fewer cars and more Canadians moving in transit overall. And in the freight sector, it's going to start saving a lot of money in terms of all those packages we get delivered to our doors for the fleet operators of heavy duty vehicles, electrified and hydrogen electrified platforms, hold out opportunity for operational savings. In the light duty sector though, well, we're talking about cars and we typically include light duty trucks and SUVs, whether we should or not is another debate. But in that sector, I'm going to say not so much. And this is a critical point, and a controversial one here. I would argue that Ontario and in Canada, we don't actually have an organic EV innovation or manufacturing sector. And despite the fact that we have had some recent announcements in this space, the history of light duty EVs doesn't point as strongly in this direction. And that is a very important policy discussion point for us to have as Canadians. So if I may, a little bit of the longer answer, and then I'll close out. I mean, the longer answer of heavy duty versus uh, light duty is two different histories. In the light duty sector of electric vehicles and hydrogen cars for personal passenger use, this all comes out of corporate average fuel economy standards. So those CAFE standards that were launched in the 1970s because of the OPEC oil crisis that then got diluted through the 90s and came roaring back with President Obama who tethered them to climate action, those CAFE standards drove auto OEMs in the United States in particular to really start pumping millions of dollars into new electrified vehicle platforms because they had no choice. This wasn't about automakers waking up and becoming climate action heroes. This was about a government choosing to regulate the sector into electrification. And that's why we have hybrid cars and plug-in hybrid cars. And the reality is today, even the announcements in Canada around Chrysler and Ford with recent EV manufacturing, that is a peripheral outcome of President Biden reigniting the CAFE standards and everybody recognizing by the laws of physics, the only way to achieve his regulatory future for environmental climate action is to produce electrified vehicles. So Canada kind of missed the boat 10 years ago when Obama was investing in that sector in the Recovery Act, we weren't in our auto sector. So we're a little bit of a Johnny come lately, but on the heavy duty side, we have been making hybrid buses. We have been innovating electrified buses. We have been designing hydrogen fuel cell buses. Some of the component parts like the Ballards and the Hydrogenics of the world have been in Canada for 20 to 30 years. And we know public transit is not going anywhere. It's ripping and roaring, ready to go, in particular with Minister McKenna's recent announcements. And we know that city councils across the country are declaring climate actions and declaring that their transit fleet being one of the dirtiest parts of city operations are going to go to zero emissions by 2040, 2050. So we have a roaring industry, an organic innovation industry, a manufacturing industry, and city councils behind it as the client 
the heavy duty electrified sector is going to transform Canadian lives. The light duty sector, it's an open question. How organic and sustainable is that landscape from a job creation standpoint? And from an adoption standpoint, you have to sell cars to households. These are expensive pieces of material. Each household has to make a choice. That's going to be a longer logarithmic burn. So that gives you the overall context. Electrification is key to climate action, but the heavy duty sector is going to lead the way. Thanks, Yusufa. I mean, it seems a bit ironic that the average person, when we use the word electric vehicle, their actually vision of it is not necessarily an electric bus. It's a, it's a Tesla car or anything in that space. And, and generally, they see it as somewhat unattainable to the average person. So I think it's an interesting question. Uh, I'd invite Charles or Paul or Brian to kind of uh, further uh, uh, comment on this notion of the state of the industry uh, relative to uh, its ability to really address uh, what uh, the de decarbonization or improve our GHG emissions, uh, et cetera, and really the environmental consciousness of a country, how it's linked uh, to this industry. Anybody want well, to if, chime if in? I may, uh, if I may, Leslie, Paul Subri here. Please. Uh, really exciting times. I think Yosipa has articulated very clearly and very well. You know, our company, we've been around since 1930. We've always tried to be the leaders, whether it was diesels uh, moving from gasoline to then hybrid electric to natural gas and so forth. The journey to zero emission is not if in our world, it's when. And quite honestly, we're well on that path. What we have in Canada is really special. We do have, uh, in many cases, natural or, or renewable energy sources. We do have industry that has capability, whether it's us as a manufacturer or component manufacturers that, that uh, as you uh, described, that, that build some of those key components. We now have a federal government that has actually put not only their words, but economics around trying to help the Canadian environment transition. And so from our perspective, it's a really exciting convergence of a bunch of stuff. You have the, the, the desire and interest to put zero emission vehicles on the road, first of all. You have a, a way more uh, a personal government, political, economic consciousness around the environmental emission dynamic. You, you take that back down into the, into the chain and you think about reskilling a whole bunch of people from building a conventional vehicle to now as a zero emission vehicle, which then goes forward to, to servicing and supporting and telematics and all these other things. And so, look, we're really excited about where we are and about the future. Canada has lagged on adoption of a lot of this stuff, uh, but the table is set now. And, and what you'll hear from Brian and the others, the, the desire not only to have the federal government put their words behind it, but funding at a support level, as well as funding associated with uh, infrastructure or, or EV financing, really sets the stage for a pretty exciting future for Canadians, both on the operational side as well as the environmental side. Charles or Brian, did you want to add before we move on to our next question? Sure, yeah, a couple of uh, comments just from, from the light duty perspective. Um, so, you know, over the past uh, six, seven months, there's been a lot of excitement in, in the EV space. And we've seen now total investments uh, from General Motors, Stellantis, formerly uh, FCA and Ford of $5.7 billion right here in Canada. And much of this is dedicated to building and assembling EVs. Uh, so this is good for a few reasons. First of all, the obvious economic uh, reason, you know, we're in, in the midst of an economic downturn like we've never seen before. If you looked at the GDP numbers uh, that came out yesterday, biggest contraction in 2020 on record. Uh, so to see the auto industry stepping up and investing in this climate, I think is really powerful. It, it's, I think the auto sector can help drive the, the recovery from COVID and from the associated economic downturn. Also, and very importantly, it gives Canada a foothold in this transition to EVs. We know that adoption rates are low right now, and I'll get into that in a little bit, uh, but now Canada is a player in that space. We're going to be building these vehicles here, and I think there's real potential to grow off that. It's going to have uh, you know, assembly itself, these new investments are going to create 3,700 direct jobs. But the amazing thing about the auto industry is the multiplier effect. So we're going to be seeing tens of thousands of jobs throughout the supply chain, auto parts, and associated economic impacts. So I think it's really exciting time uh, for the sector. I would just note that EVs alone won't help us meet our zero emission uh, targets. It's a key point and piece of it, but we also have to look more holistically at what the solution is. And to Jacipa's point, um, 
you know, alignment with the U.S. is critical. It's always been critical to the Canadian auto sector. Now that we have a U.S. administration that has made very clear commitments on EVs and emissions, uh, more to come on that, but we'll see that roll out over the next few months. For Canada to align with that administration will be very important. And then we also have to look at the overall fleet. We have a large vehicle fleet and scrapping older vehicles that are on the road that have high uh, emissions will be a critical piece of this. So it's a holistic approach to getting to those, those net zero targets. Terrific. Thanks, Brian. And actually, it's a good se segue to my uh, next question, which I'm going to direct to Charles, because I think it's, um, it's, it, it goes without saying that these uh, sort of gnarly problems, uh, climate change, etc. No one, uh, there's no silver bullet, no one, no one sector or organization can solve it by themselves. And so there's a lot of partnerships that are required. And in particular, I mean, we've, everybody visualizes an automobile or a, a vehicle itself, but there is a degree of of infrastructure that has to accompany the effective um, use and, and running of an EV system across the country. Charles, um, when we speak uh, about sustainability goals, we speak about the need for all sectors to play a part in the sustainable future that we all are, are aspiring to. Can you talk about how the Canada Infrastructure Bank and other public and private sectors are working together to advance the greening of the transportation industry? Absolutely, Leslie, and, and thanks to the Canadian Club for having me. Um, the, the CIB is supporting the acceleration of zero emissions buses uh, adoption right now. That's, that's our, our kind of short-term goal in this sector, and we're doing that in three ways. We're providing low-cost financing directly to bus operators to cover the capital cost difference between a diesel bus and a zero emissions bus. They are significantly more expensive, and, and this is a big issue with transit agencies and school bus operators across the country, especially uh, you know, in the light of last year and the, the severe drop in ridership that all transit agencies have faced. The second thing we're doing is uh, we're, we're taking the risk of the savings materializing over the life of these buses. So the, the premise is that operationally zero emissions buses are gonna be a lot less expensive to, to run. And we think that there's sufficient uh, savings there to repay the finance that we're, we're uh, offering. But that, that financing is, is a, a barrier to adoption by trans agencies because they're worried about the ability to repay over time. So we're explicitly taking the risk of those savings materializing. And if at the end of the day, they don't materialize, that, that is a cost for us and it's not a cost for the trans agency. The third thing we're doing, and this is a medium term objective, is getting private capital into this space. So right now, their private lenders are not interested in taking the risk of the savings. There's not a real track record out there in the long term, and it's, it's too high risk for the, for the level of financing that's required. We hope to build a portfolio, create that track record, and then crowd private sector capital into the sector. The CIB is also uh, investing in, in other ways in clean power. And, and we're looking very closely at, at what we can do on the light duty side in the long term in terms of the infrastructure that's gonna be required across the country. So we're excited about that as well. Thank you. Anyone else want to add in? I mean, I, we have the opportunity of having CIB here so you can uh, yeah. give, give, give lots of good advice. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd love to just comment on that. And I mean, Charles, you've heard me say this before. I think for most Canadians who are listening, they might not realize just how innovative it is for the infrastructure debt bank to have, you know, drag them this out in the open and to say that we're going to have a kind of financing solution here, because this isn't how transit usually does business, right? Like transit usually buys stuff. There's taxpayer funds. You go and buy it, you own it, you operate it till it's dead. And that's the end of the cycle. Uh, this is really about financing innovation. And we have long argued that to really get zero emissions buses out the door, battery, electric, and hydrogen. It's not just the bus, it's the charger, the fueling, the facilities modification, the energy storage, the smart charging controls. That's all new technology for transit agencies. They don't have those people on staff and they don't have those skills and they don't know what to do with that tech. And so to be able to de-risk that technology, you also have to create innovative financing tools. And I think Charles, it would be fair to say that 
most Canadians don't realize that, you know, our cities and our transit agencies actually aren't easily set up to adopt innovative financing. And so one of the most significant challenges to electrification in the future at the city level may just be the lack of cultural experience at the city level in engaging in financing mechanisms. So it's financial innovation for technological innovation, but it's a huge cultural shift that has to happen at the city and transit level to make that occur. Leslie, if I can, if I can add. Yes, please. Yes. And, and Charles and Yosipa alluded to it, you know, as a taxpayer and a citizen, forget being a, a bus guy at this point in time, the biggest single difference is that we're no longer selling a vehicle. We're selling a big part of a solution. And Yosipa rattled off a whole bunch of those different elements. And I think what, what the CIB is trying to do, not only the things Charles talked about in terms of investment uh, um, financing, uh, taking risk on future savings, the trick is going to be to make sure that the system works, which means the technology, the telematics, the preventative maintenance strategies, so that at the end of the day, there is life cycle payback, uh, as well as the, the, you know, the pace of, of adoption. Many uh, you know, people in a political environment, a bureaucratic environment, will talk about a, a revolution to, to zero emission vehicles. And I would argue, we would argue, it's very much going to be an evolution. And you'll see, almost alluded to it, we got to start get, getting going with case studies where civic governments, provincial governments, even the federal government sees how this systemic approach to the, the new transit world, if you will, around zero emission, but also different economics, different savings, different reliability, different environmental footprint, very much is a system. And so our business, for example, we don't want to sell buses anymore. We want to sell solutions and be at the table for those life cycle savings, a very different dynamic than what we saw in the past. Yeah, and Leslie, if I may add one comment there, it is actually leading to a change in the way we govern Canadians, the way in which we are democratically governed. And what I mean by that is, as um, Paul alluded to, this is an evolution and a transformation. But if we think about it, it's not a bus replacement that's happening here. It's an energy system overhaul. And for the first time, this is why we're seeing Natural Resources Canada and Infrastructure Canada. And, you know, Minister McKenna and Mr. O'Regan, I have to give Mr. McKenna a huge amount of credit for what she's done here on the file. But we're seeing Natural Resources and Infrastructure are holding hands and getting married and giving birth to a child that is unlike anything our ministries have had to produce in the past. So it is changing the way in which ministerial portfolios understand what their job is. It used to be NRCAN did fuel and energy and infrastructure over there did bus stuff and that kind of solid infrastructure. And now the two things, you just can't divide them. You either do the whole system or you do nothing at all. And that is starting to occur, but it is complicated. Perfect. Brian, did you want to add in before I'm, I'm going to uh, direct my next question to Paul, but before I do that, you're good? Okay. Uh, so Paul, I think you already started uh, to address a bit of this question, but maybe we would, we can dig a little deeper. So, um, so as, as you both, Yusipa and yourself have said, even when a, a transit operator decides to set uh, this transformative goal uh, to electric, it requires retraining, reskilling, new infrastructure investments. It all take t it takes time and money. How has this, you know, we were all working on this pre-2020, pre-pandemic. Uh, and it, your thoughts about how the pandemic has created new opportunities for operators to accelerate those conversions. Do you see uh, at this moment in time something uniquely opportunistic? Well, you know, the, the pandemic, like it had on, on all of us, has had a, an incredible uh, impact on how, you know, how we operate, how we run our business and so forth. Uh, my heart goes out to the transit agencies because they had to keep operating during pandemic. So risk and safety of their people, their customers, money uh, evaporating from any fare box revenue, budgets upside down and, and so on and so forth. I think the convergence of the pandemic, how do we get people back on the road, back moving, back into cities where public transit goes, add to that a rejuvenated approach in our country now to think about public transit as part of a solution, not just this crazy little thing that's off to the side, and then add the environmental dynamic. You know, if we could start building a city from scratch again, we'd be very thoughtful about how we move people through those cities. And, and it's the conversion that, that's going to take time and effort. And anybody that thinks it's going to happen tomorrow is, uh, you know, is rather naive about the situation. I think the building blocks are there. The thing that's really uh, interesting to think about is that you have assets that were purchased by governments and therefore you are my tax dollars that still have useful economic life. And so the trick's going to be to evolve and wean off and work out those values 
and those asset lives as we we adopt the new stuff because there is no used market really for you know heavy used or heavy equipment type in you know, our environment and so as a taxpayer we want to be very very thoughtful about the transition and I, I think the the ability of a public transit agency that now has a federal oversight and federal support, if you will, from a funding perspective, has kind of new lease on life as they start to rethink about their routes, about their equipment, about the skilling they, that's required, as well as that environmental footprint. It, it won't be easy. And of course, there's the other dynamic that, that Yosipa alluded to. There's not only colors of money, meaning the different budgets or the different groups at the federal, there's buckets of money, meaning civic, provincial and federal. And, and as we all know, that doesn't work obviously as or always as smooth as we would like. And so those poor transit agency operators that are trying to perform that essential service definitely have their work cut out of, uh, for them. But the good news is that there's a path. Uh, there's clarity now of, of political support, economic support. Uh, and, and there's that recovery dynamic that allows us to do it at a measured pace, which actually feels quite good as both a business person, but as a, as a taxpayer and a citizen. Anyone else want to add? Because I actually have a follow-on question for Paul. But um, I, yeah, I think it's 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 worth saying. I think Paul, Paul and Yospa are absolutely right. There there are a lot of different funding sources, and and transit agencies especially are are, are really used to just operating on grant funding. So we we have an education uh, role in in getting them up to speed, and and we don't believe that our financing is a silver bullet. There is still going to be a role for grant grant funding because there are a lot of costs beyond the cost of the bus that are required. So we're hoping that our involvement there and our financing will, will help bring all those things together because at the end of the day, we're taking the risk for savings materializing, but we're not doing that blinded. We're, we're, we hope to be repaid. And so it's in our interest to make sure that the charging infrastructure is in place and functioning properly in the long term, that, that the, the grid that's feeding into that is functioning and, and capable of supporting it. And, and this is all a lot of different levels of government, different arms of the federal government that, that needs to be brought together into the conversation at the same time. Mm -hmm. And Lizzie, if I may add one point that Paul raised about, you know, the definitely our hearts go out to the frontline workers in the transit industry. There is no doubt this is tough times. But we have heard from transit last year, you know, as of April, May, a few of our transit agencies reached out to us and said, look, this stuff is so complicated that when we started with our electric bus project, we had one person allocated. Now the team is 30 people just to figure out how to do it. And actually COVID has kind of given us the breathing space to deal with this because it was so difficult to understand how are we going to deliver peak period mass capacity diesel services at regular rates of service like crush capacity full-time service everywhere you go kind of service and also allocate half of our team to figuring out how to electrify and install all this new equipment and figure out all the ins and outs of kilowatt hours per kilometer and hydrogen kilograms per kilometer like that was going to be really really difficult and COVID ironically has created a bit of breathing space where some of our transit agencies have been able to allocate staff to a transition plan because they're delivering Sunday service. And so there is a silver lining here to what is a horrible, horrible pandemic. Great, terrific, thank you. That's very exciting. I, I, what I was going, and I'm gonna wait till after I ask Brian this question to ask my follow on because it's linked to it. Um, and uh, this is now, I think Brian, a uh, question for you and, and um, if I put myself and I think of my own experience about exploring the, the opportunity for EV and, and, and I will full disclosure uh, decided not to only because the condo building I'm in doesn't have an EV charger. So, so this notion of adoption and uh, specifically the, uh, to you the, uh, representing the vehicle manufacturing industry um, where the adoption rate of EVs, light and heavy is, is still low relative to other places. And uh, we wanna ask, I wanna ask you, how is it gonna be possible to achieve a kind of shared industry objectives, even further alignment so that the instruments to incent adoption are at least uh, coherent, consistent, accessible, um, and navigable for for folks um, like me. Yeah, that, it's a great question, and, and you've hit on one of the challenges, which is uh, charging infrastructure. 
Um, you know, that, that is going to be uh, the issue that we have to deal with over the next decade as we try and reach uh, the EV adoption targets that, that are necessary for uh, our GHG uh, emissions reduction goals. Uh, so just to give you a little context of, of where we're at right now, if you look at recent StatsCan data on new vehicle registrations, this is from the third quarter of, of last year, zero emission vehicles were 3.7% of all uh, new vehicle registrations. If you look at the overall light duty vehicle fleet, that's about 0.2% of the vehicles uh, on the roads right now. So we have a long way to go, particularly compared to some other jurisdictions where you see higher adoption rates. Good news is we know what the solution is, and it is consumer incentives. We know that where there are strong consumer incentives to help with uh, basically addressing that price gap that you see between an EV and a traditional gasoline powered vehicle, that's where uh, you have higher adoption rates. And there's been a lot of survey data uh, recently. Uh, the government of Canada did a big survey on, on EV adoption. KPMG does a consumer survey. Deloitte put one out. Consistent findings across the board. The biggest impediment to someone purchasing an EV is cost, followed by charging infrastructure. And then lastly, there are concerns around range. Now on the range side, you know, that as the technology advances, as you see more EVs with a 400 kilometer range coming in uh, to the market, uh, that, that should uh, start to subside. But in the interim, what we need is strong, consistent consumer incentives across Canada to help Canadians make that decision. We see a lot of interest in EVs. If you ask Canadians, random survey, would you consider purchasing an EV? You're going to see a very high proportion who say yes. The challenge is when you drill into that data and you ask, well, would you consider paying more? Two thirds of Canadians won't pay more for an EV than a traditional gas powered vehicle. So that's going to be a big challenge. According to KPMG's survey, 42% of Canadians that say they want to buy an EV in the next five years are willing to only spend between thirty dollars and $50,000. There's only 12 options available uh, in that price range right now, none of which are in popular segments. Canadians like larger vehicles. They like SUVs, vans, and light trucks. In fact, that just last month, that segment alone was 83% of all new vehicle purchases. So as these new vehicles will come to market, Ford, Stellantis, General Motors, they're introducing SUVs, they're introducing electric trucks, that's all coming. The thing is with a larger vehicle, you've got a larger, larger battery pack, which means a bigger cost. So consumer incentives will help bridge that gap as the technology advances over time. And then paired with that is more charging infrastructure. We've got 12,000 gas stations across Canada right now. We've got about 975 fast chargers. So there's a big gap there. Um, but I think with a strategy that incorporates both the municipalities, the provinces and the federal government to boost adoption, I think we can get there, but we really need to put some serious thought behind it and more investment. Others want to add to to Brian's, I'll just, plea, I'll just, Brian's plea. <laughs> I'll just comment, you know, Brian's uh, commentary is right on. And quite ironically, that's exactly the same thing we need in, in the public transit environment, which we now are starting to get with what Brian's talking about from a financing of the federal government for funding, you know, a, a, a poor analogy, but we got to figure out how to prime the pump. Once the pump gets going, the thing will be almost a self-fulfilling prophecy, but we got to get over the hurdle, which is a technology but B, it's mostly economics. And, and so what Brian just described is exactly the dilemma. And maybe as an industry, the, the, the buses in this case is a little bit further along, but it's the same dynamic. Mm. Leslie, if I may, and Brian, I'm going to jump in here with a little bit more controversial, like stick a pin in it a bit. And I think it's a worthwhile discussion to have because, hey, look, let's use a case study. Uh, if we're looking at EV incentives, it's tax dollars going out to buy a piece of property that's very expensive. You can buy a new car in Canada. You're already in a pretty good economic place, right? So, and I say this having drunk the Kool-Aid. I owned a Nissan Leaf. I used an incentive. But I'm also a single woman who earns six figures, who lives in Toronto and doesn't have children by choice. Like of global citizenry, I am privileged and perched. And I didn't need that $5,000 incentive. And a lot of EV owners didn't actually need it to buy it. So it just speaks to the privilege. And if we lived in a world of infinite resources, incentives would be great like all the other stuff. But a time's gonna come and probably it's not too far off when as taxpayers, we're gonna have to decide are EV incentives really the right pathway forward to encourage people to get into electrified vehicles and then encourage them to get out of vehicles altogether. And I would proposition that as we're in this transformational stage, EV incentives have a certain amount of impact 
As you noted, Brian, it's still under 4% adoption, so it's clearly not a revolutionary impact so far. What might have more of a revolutionary impact is if we start to price roads. And if we started pricing roads and pricing kilometers and gave Mayor, for, uh, Mayor Tory what he wanted in Toronto, among other mayors, and then we said, hey, EVs get a free ride. But if you ride anything other than EVs, you're going to have to pay 50 bucks, however many kilometers into Toronto or Montreal or Vancouver. That would drive a lot of people out of cars and a lot of people into electrification without necessarily having to incentivize as taxpayers the purchase of a diamond ring worth of an asset. You know, and that is something I think we do need to recognize. There's only so much time clicking on the, to uh, on the clock of personal household incentives before a government's going to have to wake up and recognize where a dollar's best spent. And I just don't know that EV incentives are the right pathway forward for the next 10 years. If I could just add a couple of points, sorry. Uh, yeah, so a couple of things. First of all, on the incentives, by no means should they be permanent. The, the key here is the technology. It is advancing in this space at, at an absolute rapid pace and it's still uh, you know even battery chemistry is still undecided we don't know exactly where that's going to land so as the technology advances and the prices come down and we achieve price parity you ideally get to a place where you can taper off incentives so this is by no means a suggestion that we need uh, incentives uh, you know in, in an infinite amount is to help that transition uh, and and to your point on you know when I speak about consumer incentives I'm primarily talking about addressing uh, the cost issue but there's another element to this which is really important to incentivizing people to consider an EV and that this is more in the municipal space um, but you know can you offer EV drivers things like free parking access to high occupancy vehicle lanes there are all kinds of different incentives that can really sweeten the deal for someone so when you go to make that purchase, you'll see that there are all these other benefits. And we've seen that work in other jurisdictions. So I think consumer incentives on price are important for this transition, but there's a range of other programs that governments can provide. And that's why I really would like to see more coordination between the federal, provincial and municipal governments, because you can't do this in a vacuum. One government working on an EV strategy has to be talking to all other levels of government because all of those incentives are going to work together. Maybe I could just, because uh, 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 we're starting to get in some uh, uh, questions and you're touching on some of the questions here and I'll try to kind of weave uh, this theme into two topics that came up in our questions. So in many respects, uh, with great respect to everybody, um, EV is a technology. It's not the it's not an end in itself, it's a tool to something. And at the beginning, I talked about uh, the kinds of cities, city regions we want to build and how, what role EVs should play in that. So it, it, it begs the question, which is what we are, all, you know, we were just talking about on the issue of access and affordability. Um, and uh, in many respects, as Yusipa says, car ownership, vehicle ownership is one aspect uh, or barrier, depending on who you are, uh, to jobs, uh, public transit creates more opportunity in terms of where you direct your investments and so incentives that are uh, and supports for public transit um, uh, in the conversion and transformation that Paul talked about is important. Let's Can we spend a little time because there are people trying to understand um, how uh, they can, the, the mindset of this Tesla, you know, super luxury vehicle as what represents what, what people see as the EV, the transformation and evolution that we need to get to, to the understanding that EVs can actually be uh, for everyone, uh, that it's not uh, uh, in, in the sense of uh, the type of mobility choices and the range of mobility choices, uh, car share, ride share, public transit, like the whole gamut. Uh, let's, let's, can we spend a little time uh, because folks want to understand uh, to build on what Brian's question, what more should we be thinking about in this ecosystem that EVs is uh, in some places nascent and some places has been trying, you know, uh, doing the good, good fight for quite a while? That's a long question. Yeah, let's maybe I'll jump in on the first piece, and I'm sure, Brian, you have a couple comments there as well, but if we're thinking about decarbonizing transportation, again, back to square one, what do we have to do? We've got to get people out of single passenger cars, whatever the powertrain is. We've got to move a lot of people over a lot of distance 
quickly, efficiency, efficiently with low carbon. How are we going to do that in Canada with the distances we have and the weather patterns we have? There are only a few solutions. We got to get people into first mile, last mile, or first kilometer, last kilometer solutions. And those could include small electrified vehicles, small autonomous shuttles that get you to a transit hub. And then it has to include rapid transit ways, rapid buses, streetcar, subway, and rail. There is no other way for Canadians not only to meet our climate action, but actually to live a good quality of life without killing ourselves through the emissions we pollute. So the reality is it's going to be a multimodal solution. And within that multimodal solution, we already see some pilots across Canada, loads of transit agencies are, are testing out on demand transit. Right. And so what you have is not an empty 40 foot diesel bus running around. You have an on demand little shuttle that comes to your door in, in the equivalent of an Uber app. But you happen to be sharing the ride with a few other people who happen to be on a similar route pathway that the city transit agency is delivering. So there's all these innovative things coming out and transit is at the forefront of integrating that and electrified cars as a platform have a place there. We have a lot of transit agencies that are asking about small shuttles, small vehicles, first kilometer, last kilometer solutions, and they have small light duty cars in their own fleet. So multimodal solution, got to get Canadians from their houses to their endpoint in a way that is faster, cheaper, more efficient than their cars could ever be. And that means all the incentives Brian pointed out, as well as all the technology investments into first kilometer, last kilometer shuttles, autonomy, connectivity, and rail. Leslie, if I can, I'll just kind of build on that to some extent. Anybody that lives in a big city uh, knows what congestion means and traffic. And so I've been in this business 12 years. And when I first joined, uh, I was told you're going out of business because uh, light rail is going to kill you, A. And then B, you're going to have electric vehicles going everywhere. And, you know, the advent of Uber and Lyft and all these other people and the other type of operators. There is no way that you're going to make a city efficient without a very efficient mass transit solution, whatever that might be. And yes, we're, we're coming through this pandemic and yes, the load factors on buses are, you know, 40, 50, 60% of what they should and so on and so forth. But I, I would venture to bet that uh, when we are two years from now and we've not only had herd immunity, but vaccinations and so forth, we're going to be 80, 90% of what we were pre-COVID of people moving either in cities or across cities. And there is no, whether we EV them or not, or zero emission the vehicles or not, there is no way we could run efficient cities from a time and a congestion perspective without pretty efficient mass transit type solutions, which is why I think we're in a sweet spot from a bus perspective. The, the other dynamic about light rail, and anybody who lives in Toronto, I don't, but knows the dynamics of, hey, we'll extend this subway line. It'll only cost us X billions. Well, it's now 10 years later, and it's X times 3 billion. And so with the concept of bus rapid transit or dedicated roadways, and now electrification, you've got this whole efficiency game. And I, you know, I was misled for years. I thought when they started talking about bus rapid transit, I thought it meant bus reliable transit because people wanna plan their days and the uncertainty of traffic and so forth causes, hey, I think I'm gonna take me 20 minutes for that route, but it's actually 30 or it's whatever. I think there's just continued to be this really exciting opportunity in the Canadian environment around how to use mass zero emission mass transit to play a really key role. And as Josipa talked, which I totally agree with, integrated system of first mile, last mile with uh, strong tubes, if you will, whether it's a rail or an electric bus moving people at high volume is the only way we're going to attack congestions in cities, which means then the precious commodity we'll never get back of time can be managed way more efficiently. The other dynamic is that not everybody can afford an electric vehicle or quite honestly, not everybody can afford to go on an Uber from one end of Toronto to the other end of Toronto, which is why lower cost efficient public transit is absolutely the key to efficient green cities going forward. Thank you. Um, so, a couple oh, of points. Oh, go ahead, Brian. If I could just quickly, um, just just two things on uh, around the affordability uh, piece and, and what we're seeing in, in the sector. Um, you know, first of all, there's a huge amount of investment going into, and we haven't really addressed this in, in, in this discussion yet, but autonomous vehicles. Uh, and you're seeing that from auto manufacturers and, and there's a lot of work being done uh, with uh, municipal uh, transit authorities in that area. So I think over the next little while, we're gonna see a range of new autonomous vehicles that can be used for ride sharing. Uh, and in many instances, they will be electric. Um, so I think that's, that's an exciting development and area to watch. The second piece is, you know, just back to that affordability of owning a personal EV, 
we are seeing around 120 new models coming into the Canadian market over the next few years. It's, you know, I, I, I'm actually frankly amazed almost every day. I feel like I see a new announcement from an automaker saying they're going full electric by X date. Um, so you're going to see a lot of variability. Yes. For the larger vehicles, because of the battery cost, there's still going to be a, a pretty big price tag, but over this decade, as the technology advances, consumers should have access to a much broader range of EVs. So the first thing that comes to mind won't be the $130,000 Tesla. There will be other options there for consumers. But again, it underlines the need for uh, incentives as we work through that transition. Thanks, hey, Brian. So, sorry, Leslie, can I just toss in one other thing? I, I really like what Brian's talking about in terms of the autonomous element. The downside of the problem, that a couple weeks ago, we introduced our very first fully autonomous level four uh, transit bus. The problem is if you only have one or 2% of the population of vehicles on the road that are autonomous, the system is so substandard. So I totally agree that 50 years from now, when the vast majority is autonomous and talking to each other, that that system will move efficiently. The problem is getting from here to there. And that, that unfortunately is going to take time. But boy, oh boy, if we could ever imagine a perfect scenario where the vehicles, whether regardless of whether they're cars or buses or whatever, all talking to each other and all aware of their surroundings, whether it's people or people on bikes and so forth. Holy smokes, they, to get from here to there is going to be a really rough ride. But boy, in the future, it's going to be really, really efficient. We had this exact discussion, but it was about autonomous vehicles rather than electrified vehicles, even though likely to be electrified powertrains. I would say the exact same thing again, however, and building on what Brian and Paul said, but also kind of driving a wedge between a little bit. The reality is transit will lead the way in autonomous shuttles, but they're problematic. I mean, the federal government through Transport Canada funded millions of dollars in autonomous shuttle pilots across Canada, from Calgary to Surrey to Vancouver, now in Toronto, the latest one, Trois Rivières, and it hasn't led to a whole bunch of procurements of autonomous, light, low, uh, low speed, light duty, electrified vehicles. And it's because somebody has to install the DSRC unit. Units. Somebody has to install all the roadside infrastructure. Somebody has to operate these digital robots on wheels and the transit agency is not ready for it. So it's equally complicated. It's a whole system overhaul. And so we're back to square one again in the sense that transit will lead the way on stuff, but it's complicated. Investment has to happen. If we wait for individual passenger cars to lead the way, we're going to be waiting 100 years to address the climate. So it's the same kind of dialogue that crops up again and again. So I'm good. There's a recurring question coming in from the audience, uh, around, and many of you have touched on this, which is the issue of this, whatever the this is, policy, planning, incentives, training, research, all needs to be better coordinated, higher levels of collaboration amongst different levels of government. So to you as a panel, um, we can talk about the need for it. What would, like, what's, what's the next step? What, you know, you had your dream scenario about figuring how we can get to a better place of collaboration. Uh, what would it, next week, what would happen? I think people are you know, trying to understand, we're saying it's going to be hard, so, but where do we start? Like, I mean, we've already started, but where do we start on this journey of collaboration? Charles is looking like he wants to jump in. Yeah, I think the, the reality is in, in Canada, we're, we're a little bit behind in transit. You know, we, we, are not, we are not the most advanced. We're not taking advantage of, of the technologies that are out there and the new modes that are out there. And, and part of that is intergovernmental cooperation and, and lesson sharing. And, you know, Qtrix playing a role in this, Qt is playing a role in this. There, there are uh, associations out there that are trying to facilitate that. But at the end of the day, government needs to do a better job in, in coordinating its, its policy approach to these problems so, so that Transport Canada can, you know, roll out a, a regulation and, and, and transit agencies at the municipal level can then adopt that and, and quickly implement it. And, and, there, and, and, and then pay for it at the end of the day and pay for it in, in the most efficient way possible. So I think it's an intergovernmental cooperation issue from a, from a policy perspective and then from a practical implementation perspective that, that needs to happen. But Charles, just uh, help me here. Uh, you know, we've seen uh, high degrees of collaboration happen during a pandemic re relative to vaccinations. We've seen public health officers cooperating together, you know, mostly. Um, in, the in, in the notion of what you're saying, what is missing uh, that it isn't happening? We know we need it. We've all said we want it on all these different dimensions. Is it that we don't have a burning platform? What, what is the, you know, no pun intended. Um, uh, 
Uh, what is it? Uh, yeah, you know, what I touched on earlier. The, the pandemic has actually provided some opportunity to, to transit agencies, provincial governments, and the federal government to, to take a step back and think about these things, have a little bit more space to think about them. So I think, you know, part of the issue is the the immediate needs that all of the transit agencies across the country, for the most part, are you know they're 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 running on the edge. It, they're 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 not revenue they're not revenue neutral. They they need grant funding, so there's always a scarcity of resources, and it's where to focus those. And I think the the breathing space that some of them have had, not from a financial perspective, but from a time perspective, over the last while, has has uh, increased that that collaboration. And and I hope that it, it continues uh, as as things move forward. Hey, Leslie, um, I've had the, the pleasure of touring the Prime Minister through our facilities, as well as uh, Minister McKenna a couple of times. And she asked me probably a year ago, maybe just before COVID, exactly that question. And my response to her was, we need the federal government to put a stake in the ground about what the policy is going to be. A, do we believe in public transit? B, do we believe it needs to be green? And so I think what's happened in the last year is some of that has really gone from let's talk about it to money where your mouth is. Then what's happened is not only given Brian or Charles sort of mandate through that what CIB can actually do, very different than what we had in the past. Now the recent announcement about, about commitment to funding. So my next ask then is to find a way or my next perfect world or, or dream as you d- described would be a little bit like Charles just said, as well as Josipa is, how do we get the feds, the provinces, and the cities to say, yeah, we all believe in the same thing and let's collaborate to, to get there because the time is going to be our enemy, even with a federal support or money or whatever, it, it, the, the trickle effect is going to take forever. What's exciting for us now is it's not like the technology has to be invented. We know how to make electric vehicles. We know how to make a fuel cell, hydrogen fuel cell bus. We know how to put that in service. Yeah, there's some creativity and flexibility and learning we need to do on the charging infrastructure and how to optimize. How do we get the utilities involved so that there's an optimum energy solution? Because that's the other naivety to some extent. We had a mayoral candidate in Winnipeg a couple of years ago say, well, overnight I'm going to buy 500 electric buses. And I said, well, that's pretty cool. But where are you going to get 42 megawatts of power every night to just charge that fleet? Right? Like There needs an integrated strategy. And to me, that's the biggest issue is We've gone from subsets or individual discussions to now a system conversation. Clearly the table is set for the governments, but also for businesses and and individuals to push it. But we're a long way from where we were a year ago, where it seemed almost apathy. We're behind, so what? I'm actually quite encouraged. Mm, and but if I can add to that though, Leslie, I mean, there's encouraging moves. There's no doubt. I mean, the Fed's just announced billions and millions of dollars for transit, unlike any investment previously. And I have to say, it's not by accident that it is Minister McKenna, a woman, with Minister Friedland as finance minister, a woman leading for the first major investment in public transit. Women care about transit because we use it to get around and live our lives and earn our income. I think that is not by accident something to highlight here. But having said that, money is only part of the equation. And building on what Paul said, and back to my point about reorganizing government, we have 10 provinces in this country. Not one of them has a transportation energy strategy that says by 2030, by 2040, this many Canadians will move by this much public mobility using this carbon intensity. We don't set targets. So we can throw money at this all we want and hope that the target emerges like a bouquet of flowers that we don't water. It's not going to happen. At the end of the day, we need transportation energy strategies provincially across the country, which would mean, again, getting ministries of transportation, ministries of energy, and ministries of economic development to hold hands and have some kind of hybrid child. It's never happened before. Our ministries are designed for the 20th century and we're living in the 21st with 21st century complexities. So folks, we're coming, yeah, close to the end, but uh, there is one, there are a couple of questions here that I think quickly, if I can get someone to respond. We've talked a lot about cities. There's a question here around rural agricultural industry and the role of EVs in that space. So areas, there's not public transit. uh, um, The agricultural industry is a different type, rural communities. Anyone want to uh, sort of jump in? Uh, Brian? Sure, yeah. Um, it's a really, really important question, and it leads to, you know, the discussion that we were having earlier around infrastructure. It's one thing uh, to consider an EV when you live in an urban area. There's already some buildup uh, with charging. Uh, maybe you have a condo that, that offers you the ability to charge in, in your parking lot. 
the challenges in rural communities um, where you, you don't have the density, so there may not be uh, the, the push to put in place uh, a charging uh, infrastructure unit there, that will be an issue. And, you know, Canada, we have 1.1 million kilometers of public roads. Um, and this is a challenge. When you look at, at, to a lot of Canadians' driving behaviors, you know, I think about myself, 90% of what I do is within 20 kilometers of my house. It's dropping the kids at school. It's getting groceries. These are small trips. I happen to have family that lives on Lake Huron. So twice a year, I do a 1,500 kilometer round trip and there's no infrastructure to charge a, an EV. That will be a challenge. And in rural communities, uh, we're going to have to address that. We're going to have to build that infrastructure. And I think that relates to you know, what Paul was saying around having an integrated strategy. Um, you know, this is a constant Canadian challenge in a range of policy issues where we have federal and provincial responsibilities. And sometimes there isn't a great deal of coordination. So how do we get a coordinated approach on this, on the infrastructure, on incentives to make sure that we help every community? Thanks, Brian. I squeezed that last little question in there because I know there are a number of the audience. So um, I know I'm going to turn it over to Karen, but I want to personally thank all of you for a really engaging and exciting conversation. Over to you, Karen. Thanks, Leslie. Uh, and thanks to our guests and panelists for uh, spending your lunch hour with us today. Uh, as Canada leads the way in electric transit, we look forward to seeing your organization's innovation and infrastructure implementation, as well as vehicles on the road. Uh, Brian, Josipa, uh, Paul, and Charles, thank you for joining us. Leslie, it was great to have you join us. And I always personally appreciate an active moderation style. It was an absolute pleasure to, to be part of the conversation here and, and, and watch you as you weaved it all together. Expertly done. Thank you so much. Um, guests, before you log off, let me tell you quickly about some of our up upcoming events. So later this month, we will be building off today's topic of electric vehicles and we're diving into supply chain. We hope you'll join us with leaders from the Ontario Mining Association, Avalon Advanced Minerals and others for a discussion on the changing landscape of critical mineral supply chains and the opportunities they afford Ontario as part of Canada's revitalization and growth efforts. And tomorrow, we hope that you'll join us as we celebrate International Women's Day. We'll hear from a group of incredible women who've been the first in their fields and hear what needs to be done to ensure that they are the first of many. So thank you again to BLG and Panasonic for sponsoring today's event. Our events would not be possible without our sponsors. So thank you for your continued generosity. Thank you to our AV supplier, Van Volkenberg Communications and livemeeting.ca for making it possible for us to come together virtually today. Guests, merci. Thank you for joining us. Please stay healthy. Please stay safe.